Hello, you're listening to the podcast of Bay Ridge Christian Church. Each Sunday, our aim is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ from the text of the Bible and to catalyze the hearts of our hearers to love and gratitude towards God and all of His creation. We hope you enjoy this teaching, and we pray that you will be encouraged to trust in Jesus today. So today I'm going to be talking about calling. For example, we did an entire series on calling a number of years ago. So you could go download the outlines, look at it all. But that's all there for further study. Secondly, there's an opportunity coming up, uh, which is actually going to be on uh, January the 21st, which is a Saturday, from 8 to 11 a.m., right over at 255 West Street, which is where downtown Hope is. There's going to be a seminar that I have helped set up. I'm unfortunately not even going to be in town when it happens. But it's called The New Creation and the World of Work. Uh, The C.S. Lewis Institute is working with this. That's part of how I'm involved as I try to help uh, with CSLI some. But it's going to be a three-hour seminar helping people think how they can work Christianly if I can put it that way. In other words, my day-to-day tasks that God has for me, my calling that I'm doing most of the week, how do I approach that as a believer? And also, if there are particular gifts and callings God has given me, how might I use those to be a blessing in the local community? So what we're hoping to do out of that is actually foster maybe some groups that would get together where people who work, for example, in education, or people who work in business, or people who work in arts, or the government, or whatever, might start developing relationships and thinking and praying together about how the believers in our area could be using the callings they have to bless the community, which should sound familiar to us in our congregation, right? That we're blessed, we want to be a blessing. So if you're interested in doing that, there's information in the booklet. There's a, it came out in the bridge this week as well. You can sign up, it's completely free. Uh, it's a, a couple uh, named Amy and Frog uh, or Ewing from, uh, they actually uh, ran the CSLI in London for a number of years. They're going to be here in the States doing some things and they're going to be kind of kicking this off with that discussion that morning. It's an area they've worked a lot in, in some difficult areas in London, some of the poor areas in London. They've been involved in community ministry. And so it's a great opportunity. So both of those are there if the Lord prompts and you want to take more uh, time to look at it. With that, we're going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into God's Word. Father, it is a new year, but one thing we know has not changed. Lord, we need to hear from you. Lord, we desperately need for you to open your Word to us, for your Word is life. And so, Lord, we come before you humbly right now and we ask for ourselves and for our children that you would speak to us. Father, I pray for the teachers upstairs and I pray for myself that we would hear and speak what your Holy Spirit has for us as your people today. Father, that we would faithfully open your word and teach your word because that's what matters, Lord, what you have spoken not what we think or want, but what you have spoken. Father, we pray that you would come and speak to us. And Lord, we pray also for all of us who are hearing your word, the kids upstairs, us here uh, in the congregation, Lord, that you would give us hearts that are soft, that you would speak to us. Lord, renew our minds, transform our wills. And Father, I pray this not only for our congregation here, but I pray this for other gatherings of believers around this city and region right now. Lord God, would you speak to your people today? Here at the beginning of a new year, would you set our feet firmly planted on the right path? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to uh, just do a, a teaching that's kind of a standalone teaching to begin the year. Next week, we will resume our series in Mark. We'll be going back to Mark's gospel uh, next week, starting at chapter 2. But for today, I'm going to be doing a teaching on faithfully fulfilling our callings, and we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, and also 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. We're going to kind of have these two texts, because I want to show that they're really teaching the same thing, using a little bit different words. But Paul and Peter 
are trying to communicate a similar concept to us regarding how we are to faithfully fulfill our callings. So you can follow along in the booklet or on the screens or in your Bible, but hear now the word of the Sovereign Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And then in 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So today is uh, January the 1st, the beginning of a new year, and many of us in here may have already made New Year's resolutions. This is what I want to do better on this year. Uh, And most of us have probably already broken those resolutions, right? It's hard to make those kind of changes. I remember when I, uh, at uh, times past, when I've been a member in a gym, a gym is never more crowded than in January because everybody got themselves a Christmas present and they would come down and you could never find parking, you could never get to the weights or the other machines you were trying to use until about three weeks into January and then it'd be thinned back out to the normal crowd (laughs) that was going to be there. So we all kind of go through this thing and if we're believers, we oftentimes have resolutions, I want to read the Bible more or I want to pray more. In essence, I want to give Jesus a little bit bigger slice of my pie. And not saying that it's wrong for us to do that. That can be a helpful thing for us to do. But I want to give us a little bit different way of thinking about how we can grow in this coming year. And that is related to our callings. The Bible speaks much more of the importance of the callings and gifts that God has given to us and us faithfully walking in those than it really does say come up with a new year resolution for how you're going to do something different this year. And as we understand this, it helps us to really think through what are the responsibilities and tasks that God is actually assigning to us and calling us to walk in. And this is going to be important for us to think through because the fact is each of us have many callings. Sometimes Christians come up with a wrong understanding and we say, you know, I have Christians come up to me and say, hey, Brett, when did you receive the call? By which they mean, when did you know you were called to be a pastor? But one of the problems with that is I received the call when I was 16 because the call is the call to Jesus Christ. That, that's the call that all of us have in this room. I received a call to be a Marine. I received a call to be a computer programmer for a while. I also had a call to be a husband and a father. All of these, I now have a call to be uh, an elder and a pastor, but that is not unique. Every one of you have multiple callings before God, and every one of you have to walk faithfully in those callings just like I do in mine. And so what's really important for us to recognize is if we learn to think in terms of callings, then I'm not really trying to give Jesus a little bit bigger slice of the pie. How much of the pie does Jesus have? All of it. All of it. So what I'm not trying to do is carve out a little more time on Monday outside of the work and all that stuff. I've got. No, my work is part of me worshiping and serving Jesus. And it's part of how Jesus wants to work in and through me. And so the goal is not to give him a little bit better, bigger slice of the pie. The goal is to recognize he's at work in all of life and how can I serve him in every area of life. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's start by trying to just make sure we understand what gifts and callings are about biblically because I think there's a lot of distortion in the church today. Now notice Paul in Colossians chapter 3 is teaching on fulfilling our callings. So notice here Paul does not say when you gather as the church make sure you do this well. He says whatever you do. How much of life does that cover? All of, whatever you do, 
All of life is being referenced here. And he's talking about the ways that we serve others. And so in this very passage, which I'm just looking at two verses, he talks about how the church conducts itself when it gathers together. He talks about the relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, uh, slaves and masters. No matter what was going on in your life, Paul says, I've got all of this in view this is what i'm talking about how you walk out and fulfill those callings and in fact even as he goes through his list it becomes apparent that all of us have multiple callings i for example am a husband and so he begins his list there you know with with husbands and what husbands are called to do but i'm also a father i'm also an elder in the church I have in the past had other jobs and things that I was called to do. Today, I even volunteer with various organizations. All of those are part of my calling. Not just one of them. All of them together are, and that's exactly how Paul is addressing it to the Colossians here. And so, notice he's, he's telling us this, but the other point is, he says, recognize that in every one of these areas, ultimately, your service is is to God. No matter how it is you're serving, if you're a husband being a good husband, you're actually doing this in service to God. If you're a wife being a good wife or a parent or a child, a master or a slave or whatever your role in relationship is, ultimately your service is to God. And he points out there that you're going to receive an inheritance from the Lord, that the Lord is going to reward us for that service. And it's in all of the areas. It's not just in one area. It's not as if on on Judgment Day I will stand before God and the only thing he's going to look at is how faithfully did I serve as a pastor in this congregation. He's going to look at every area to which he called me in life. And the reward that Paul speaks of there is our eternal reward for our service in all of these areas. Now Peter, in the other passage, really speaks of the same exact idea. He uses the idea of spiritual gifts, but it really is ultimately how we are receiving something from God so that it can be used to serve other people. So notice there in verses 10 and 11, he tells us each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. So notice he's not just talking, he's going to give one or two very broad categories and examples, but Peter has already situated it and said, look, all of you have gifts from God. Each of those gifts may differ. The key thing is whatever gifts you have been given by God, you need to use them to serve other people. The gifts may be differently, but ultimately they have to be used to serve others as part of our service to God. The way I serve God is by using the gifts to serve other people. And so Peter here speaks of faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And by grace there, he doesn't mean that you get one kind of grace and I get another related to salvation. Grace is the way it works out in my life is what we refer to as spiritual gifts. The way the grace of God works in my life is going to be distinct from the way it works in my wife Linda's life, the way it works in Robin's life and Margot's life. Every one of us, the grace of God interacts with us in a distinct manner. And Peter says, you need to, you need to be aware of that and your call is to be a faithful steward the actual word you are to you are to steward and administer god's grace in its various forms and that's how you fulfill your callings in life so from these two passages we understand there's basically five distinct points that come out here and i'll give a definition then so look at these points number one each of us has received different callings and gifts from god if you are here you have been called and you have been gifted Number two, these callings and gifts are given by God so that ultimately he can serve others through us. See, this is one of the key things. We, we oftentimes think, and it is true, that I serve God by serving others, but really because God gives the gift, because God gives the calling, ultimately what my callings are is how God wants to serve my neighbor through me. God is active in doing that and so this was one of martin luther's key insights his calling is not so much about me serving others as it is god serving my neighbor 
through me. Every single one of us. And it does not matter whether that's because I'm preaching the word or if I'm going to work tomorrow and doing my work as a, uh, as a teacher or a politician or a journalist or a medical worker or whatever it is, God wants to serve others through me. Number three, callings and gifts are not restricted to church life. They touch every area of life where we can be used by God to serve others. Every area of life. There is not one area of life that Jesus is not involved in. And that does not mean, by the way, that, well, then I, I've, I've got to only work in Christian environments. No, that's not the case. Whatever environment, it's as broad as it can possibly be, God wants to work through us. Number four, we each have multiple callings, okay? Everybody has multiple callings. And then number five, we'll ultimately be rewarded by God for how faithfully we use our gifts to fulfill these various callings that we've been given by God. So I would put all this together, and here's how I would define callings that I want us to think of here for this upcoming year. Calling refers to the specific tasks and responsibilities given to us by God through which God works to serve our neighbors and to promote the common good, restraining the effects of the curse and bringing blessing to every realm of life and every corner of creation. Now you get, I'm, I, I'm purposely trying to be broad here. Everything, it's not just the church, every realm of life, every corner of creation. Abraham Kuyper, probably the most famous thing that, that he said, he was a Christian pastor, theologian, also politician. He was prime minister of the Netherlands. And Kuyper famously said, there's not one square inch of the cosmos that Jesus does not look and say, mine. Now, he does not mean that all of those have to be part of the church. What he means is that God is at work everywhere. And he's doing that through us as we faithfully serve in those areas. So I'm going to take this now and kind of break it down each of these different aspects briefly for us to think through for this coming year and how we can kind of approach this year in faith so that hopefully a year from now we can say, wow, this was a year where I grew in faithfully fulfilling my callings. So number one, calling are the specific tasks and responsibilities given by God. So again, notice that you're working for the Lord, not men. Whatever gift you've received, of course, if it's a gift, what does that mean? It's not mine. It's coming from someone else, which means it's coming from the Lord. So the callings and the gifts come from God. Uh, We're working for the Lord, serving Him in our callings. And so spiritual gifts, again, we've sometimes really narrowed these down to a couple of gifts that everybody wants to argue over, but it's as broad as all of life. Spiritual gifts are simply the way the Holy Spirit works in each of us uniquely. And it's the unique way the grace and the Spirit of God work in us to enable us to serve others as God works in and through us. So two people who even have the same gift, it's going to be experienced and expressed distinctly. Because, as it were, to put it in more modern parlance, when the grace of God and the Spirit of God hit my unique DNA, it looks different. And it is for every individual person. So the goal is not for me to even express my, my teaching gift like somebody else does it. No, that, that's not going to work. Okay, It needs to be how God is at work in me. Now, what this means is it takes into account everything about us. It takes into account our natural, quote-unquote, personality, our gifts, our abilities, our life experiences, the particular way the Holy Spirit works best in our lives. All of that is taken into account, and Paul and Peter are both saying, that's your calling, that's your gift. And that's what God wants you to faithfully administer, to work. So when we start to think this way, all of life becomes an area where I'm serving God. I'm not trying to squeeze and repartition my life. I'm trying to say, how is God at work in every aspect of my life? Now, this also takes into account circumstances that are completely beyond our control. 
Life is full of things that I don't control. Now, why I bring this up, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 to 24, Paul is writing in one of the most unusual passages in the New Testament. And notice, so that I'm, I'm not wrenching this out of context, notice I've got highlighted there called. How much is he talking about calling in this text? Eight times in eight verses. Okay? I, I've told you before, you, you don't have to get a doctorate in theology to be able to note if he talks about something eight times in eight verses, this is a key area. So Paul is saying, let me explain to you, Corinthians, about calling. And notice what he's telling them is, Calling includes life situations beyond your control. Paul says, were you circumcised when you called? How many of the Corinthians would have volunteered to be circumcised? W when were you circumcised? At eight days old back then. Okay, eight-day-old children don't volunteer for something. It was decided for them. And if you weren't circumcised as a child, Paul said, you didn't make that decision either. Furthermore, this is really hard for us to understand. He even talks about being a slave. If you're a slave, don't worry about it. That's hard. But see, Paul says it's inconsequential in you serving God. You can serve God no matter what your life circumstance, no matter what your life situation is. Now, Paul's not saying slavery is a good thing. And he's not saying that you're, this is not st uh, stoic fatalism. Because notice he goes and says, look, if you're a slave and you can get free, get free. But what I'm telling you is, if it's beyond your control and you can't do it, don't waste your energy worrying about what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. You can serve God even as a slave. And in many other places, he says, look, you need to understand if you are the Lord's, if you are a slave, you're the Lord's freed man. And if you're a master, you're the Lord's slave. Okay? In every area, Paul is saying, look, do this. Don't fret. God is in control and he has you on mission right where you are, even if right where you are is a slave. Now that, that cuts across the grain of our society. This cuts across how our culture wants to think. But see, it's actually very freeing. Because what it means is, I don't have to fret about the gifts I don't have. I don't have to fret about the circumstances that, that I don't have that I would like. I don't have to fret about the opportunities I wish I had that I don't. I simply have to walk in the area that God has opened up for me. Whatever that is, there I am serve. And so faithfulness in our callings does not fret over circumstances beyond our control or on what gifts and opportunities we do not have, but rather focuses on the gifts and opportunities we do have and uses those to serve God and serve others. Okay? So that's the number one point regarding it because we can spend a lot of time fretting over what I don't have. In fact, one of the root vices is envy which is overwhelmingly, but I want the set of gifts that person's got. That's not what God's call for us is. Second point, calling is God working through us to serve others. Notice here, I'll just look at 1 Peter chapter 4. But notice again, the idea is that it is a gift. You are speaking the very words of God. You are serving with the strength that God provides. And you're doing it so that God may be praised. This is where Luther's insight comes in. It's not so much me serving God by serving others as it is God serving others through me. That's my calling. Wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing, whatever circumstances God has opened up, God is actually speaking and working through me to be a blessing to others. This is why our tagline every week, you are blessed, go forth and be a blessing because God is blessing me and he's doing it so that I can just simply be a channel through which the blessing of God flows to other people. So ultimately, and, and notice the, the phrase there that I've got highlighted in yellow is we do all this to serve others. We've turned spiritual gifts almost into something that is self-serving, something that is about me. But 
And, and we think of, when we do talk about vocation and calling, so much of it today is how do you find this thing that you become completely self-actualized by doing? The Bible says that's a completely wrong way of looking at it. My calling is not about me. My calling is about others. My calling is how God wants to work through me to bless and serve others. So the focus is not on me, but on others. So think about it this way. As creation and salvation are the overflow of the life and the love of the Trinity, so God's work within us overflows to serve other people. In other words, at the beginning of time, there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What did Father, Son, and Holy Spirit need? Nothing, okay? God didn't make us because he was lonely. He was perfectly fulfilled. But because God is such a self-fulfilled being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that relationship spills over and the cosmos comes out. God creates. And then God blesses and blesses. It's his very nature. Well, when the life of God is at work in us, when the Spirit of God is at work in me, what does that produce? Overflow, abundance, blessing to others, even if I'm the slave in Corinth. Don't have any money, can't go where I want, do what I want, Paul, doesn't matter. The Spirit of God's at work in you. The Spirit of God is bubbling up in you, and He can work and bless through you no matter what the circumstances are. So all of this is showing that God is at work. It's more than just me serving others. In my calling, God is at work in and through me. So see, this should be exciting to us. If you are a new believer, It doesn't matter if you became a believer last night. God wants to be in and at work in and through you. Okay, He's actually even doing it through atheists. They don't know that he's doing it. But God is actually working through everyone, whether they recognize it or realize it or not. And so what this means is, as that is my focus, paradoxically what happens is it gives deep joy and fulfillment as I see God work through me to bless others. But the focus is not me being blessed. The focus is other people being blessed. The overflow of that is blessing comes back to me. But if I put the focus on me, it shuts down blessing for others and it shuts down joy and blessing for me. An example you can think of, I use this all the time actually in our pre-marriage counseling and in talking with other people. When I was a Marine, we would sometimes have, have Marines that were struggling hitting the target three to 500 yards down range. And one of the things that I commonly knew would happen when a Marine would start whiffing and missing the target is I would ask, what are you focusing on? I'm focusing on the target, and there's your problem. You don't focus on the target. You focus on the front sight post on the rifle because your eyes can only focus on one thing at a time. If you focus on the front sight post, the target gets blurry, but you'll hit the target. If you focus on the target, the front sight post, it looks like two of them, and you're guessing the wrong one, and you're whiffing and missing, okay? Who in here would like to be blessed and have joy? Be honest. How do you get it? You put your focus on blessing others. And you'll get the target downrange of being blessed and finding joy yourself. Put the target on your own self-fulfillment, your own satisfaction, you're going to miss the target. And nobody's blessed. It's the paradox, but it's because it's the very nature of God. Our God is a giving God. And joy is found as we give others. Third, calling works to promote the common good. So again, notice Paul's words, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So again, all of life is in view. And specifically in the previous verses and the following verses, Paul's talking about slaves and masters. So if you are a slave and you have a terrible master, what do you do? See, what's the temptation? What do I want to do? Right. I'll work hard when he's looking, and then when he's not, I ain't serving that clown. 
See, that's not the attitude of God. And, and the scripture specifically says that. Work hard whether they're watching you or not because you are actually serving Christ. So am I giving my full effort to that terrible boss because I'm not really serving them? I'm ultimately serving Christ. And what I'm doing is I'm promoting the common good. Now, this is important for us because as God's exile people, we are called to work and see our city, our area flourish with the shalom of God. Okay? Not just the church, everything, everywhere is opened up. So I'll bring up a passage we've looked at a number of times, Jeremiah 29. This was important. We talked about it in the series on Daniel. Okay, Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles. They've been carried off to Babylon. Now, y'all work with me. Was Babylon a good, godly place that was encouraging them to walk with Jesus? No, not at all. It's pagan. Why were they in Babylon? Babylon had destroyed them, right? Had, dis- had burned the temple down, tar- carted off all the temple utensils and materials and everything else this is a disaster and some of the exiles said we're just going to sit here by ourselves and we're waiting because god said he's going to take us back and we're not going to do anything i'm not working with these babylonians into that jeremiah writes these words this is what the lord almighty the god of israel says to all those i carried into exile okay Notice again, their circumstances. I carried you into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity. The NIV puts two words there. It's actually seek the shalom. They're trying to say it, it means both things. The peace of Babylon and the prosperity of Babylon is all the shalom of Babylon. Of the city to which I have called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, if it experiences shalom, Lord, you too will experience shalom. And what is the unspoken threat? If it doesn't experience shalom, see, we, we want, this, this happens a lot. Oh, no, the whole thing can burn down around us, but the church is going to be treated differently, not according to God's word. You want to be blessed? Pray and work for the common good of the city to which God has placed you. Right here. Okay, we need to have a passion for this. My, my, my wife, who's out in the lobby now, is going to be shaking her head because I'm bringing her up. But she laughs and shakes her head because of how often I say when we are in Annapolis how much I love Annapolis. Now, this city is nothing like where I grew up. And at first, when I first came here to the Naval Academy, Annapolis was just the little place I went through that I thought had no reason to exist other than to serve midshipmen. Honestly, until my eyes got opened. And you know why I love this city? Because it's the place to which God has called me. And so I am passionate about this city. And I want to see this city experience the shalom of God, the peace and prosperity of God. And so I want to pray for this city. I want us to be engaged and involved in this city. I want us to see the common good. I don't want to say, well, Jesus blessed Christians, but my next door neighbor, Muhammad, he's a Muslim. I hope you curse him. Is that that the heart of God? No. I I want Muhammad to flourish. Now, the best way Muhammad can flourish is I want him to understand and embrace the gospel. I want him to stop trying to serve God by law, but rather receive the grace that is offered through Jesus Christ. But I want him to prosper. And I want all of us to do that. So that includes praying and working within our callings to serve our neighbors and promote the common good and flourishing of our city. Now, there's two parts that we had in our definition of calling on that. And one is to restrain the effects of the curse. And the other is to extend blessing. Why did the curse come to the earth? 
because of our sin, right? Genesis chapter 3, we sinned and there is a curse that comes. And it touches everything. Does the effects of the curse touch my callings? Yes, it does. I labor very, very hard to understand God's word and try to accurately proclaim it to you all, but that does not mean I'm perfect at it. The effects of the fall and the curse affect everything, even when I'm standing here trying to teach the word. Okay? Everything is affected by it. Sin touches everything. But We are still called to labor faithfully in our calling and to try and restrain the effects of the fall. Because because of the curse, God said when you plant, what is the ground naturally going to grow? Weeds. So do farmers say, well, then we just let the weeds grow? What is their calling? Restrain the weeds. (laughs) Try and get the crops to produce better and more so that people can eat, so that there can be blessing and it can be extended. And so This continues even after the fall. Again, we are blessed, and God wants to extend the blessing. Now, what this is part of is what's known as common grace. And I'm not going to talk about common grace a lot. I'm Actually, it's what I'm going to go over in after hours this week. But when we tend to think of grace, we think of me getting saved, right? I'm saved by grace. And that is part of grace, and that is very, very important. But common grace is something distinct. Common grace refers to the aspect of God's grace that restrains sin and its effects and gives general blessings to humanity and creation so they can at least partially fulfill God's original design for them. But it's not salvation. So can God work through my unbelieving neighbor? Yes, he does all the time. Okay, I don't know if Dr. Salk was a Christian. But was it good that he created a vaccine for polio? Yes. It's a huge blessing that he did so. God is at work even through people who may not acknowledge him. God can still use their labors to further uh, good in the creation. So God's not abandoned the creation. He's not abandoned unbelievers, but he's kind to them. What did Jesus tell us happens about rain? Who does God send rain on? The righteous and the wicked, okay? He, he just does. I've talked to Christians, no, no, it's going to rain on the Christian's property and not on the unbeliever's property. Have you gotten out of the house much? It doesn't work that way because that's not the heart of God. So God is at work in all of these, and God gives gifts of common grace so that people can still enjoy God's creation and work to develop creation and culture. It's what we were all called to do. It's what God's doing in Genesis 1 and 2. That is still in effect. And so we have calling, so do unbelievers. And we can partner together with unbelievers in many common areas to work for the flourishing of our city. Now, what we can't partner with is I can't partner with unbelievers on the proclamation of the gospel. They don't know the gospel. They're not doing that. But we can, for example, we mentioned, you know, with Daniel and Veronica coming here. When COVID hit, what was the first thing that our church deployed and got involved in? Pop-up pantries. Now, not everybody involved in doing the pop-up pantries were believers. In fact, there were many businesses that were donating foods. I still remember the day I still remember the number. We got 618 Cornish game hens that we handed out that day. And I joked and said, the number one Google search in Annapolis today is probably going to be in Spanish saying, how do you cook a Cornish game hen? (laughs) What in the world do you do with these things? Okay, somebody donated all of those. They don't have to be a believer. We can partner together to say people are hungry Because right now, businesses are shut down, and we want to make sure they get food. And we as believers can partner with them in that. Now, what we also had at the end of the line was, would you like prayer? Can we hand out Bibles to you? Are there things we can do to share the gospel with you? We we want to do both. It's not either or. There may be times where in our culture, particularly the way things are today, that people's designs and desires and what they think will be good is the exact opposite of what is actually good. And I can't partner with them. I can't help them to spread confusion and sin and problems. But 
even with those folks, there are areas I can find that we can labor together. We can partner together. And so this is an idea of what calling is like. So how do we apply this and we'll come to the Lord's table? Because we're talking about doing this for this year. One simple question really for us, and that is, do I know the areas to which God has called me? Do I know what they are? Again, every one of us has many callings from God. So the question is, could, could you say, this, this is where I know that I've been called by God? It's usually going to be discerned based on our gifting, our life experiences, and our opportunities. And what that means is sometimes my callings change. So I could have a new calling in 2023 I didn't have in 2022. Okay? And there are things I might have been called to in 2022 that I'm no longer called to in 2023. So a big part of it is, Lord, what are you calling me to do? What are these things? Now, I'm going to throw up a list of of things that we've talked about a little bit this morning that are there. There's callings in family, church, work, and by work, notice I put in parentheses, paid or unpaid. If I'm retired, does that mean I no longer, am I retired from callings? No. No. It actually means, in Paul's metaphor, I'm the slave that's been set free. I've now got extra freedom. i got extra time that I can deploy my gifts, my abilities, my calling wherever I want because I don't have to worry about taking the paycheck in anymore. So volunteer service. Citizenship. Every one of us in here, in a democracy, we have a calling of citizenship that we do get to affect what goes on there. And then there's even membership in other groups, you know, civic organizations, community associations, hobbies that we're involved in. All of those can be part of our calling, okay? And God wants to work to all. So I want you to look at those and and think through them and then ask yourself, could I sit down and start to give a list and say, these are areas where God has called me. These are the things that I think God has called me to. Um, And Related to that, does that mean are there areas that God is calling me that I've not been doing before or things that he's telling me to drop? Are there areas where I'm spending resources? And by resources, think broad. Time, effort, money, thought, all of this that God's not calling me to. Because one of the problems is that Sometimes what we do is I've got so many things going on and God has not called me to certain things that I'm not fulfilling what he has called me to. I can't faithfully administer if I'm trying to do everything that I wasn't given. Remember Jesus had many parables where he would give, you know, a guy goes away and he gives, you know, 10 talents to this guy. and five. See, what he doesn't tell him is the guy with 10 talents to worry about what the guy with five talents is doing. You just stick to what I gave you to do, Okay. So are there areas maybe where I'm looking as I think through these and it's like, you know what, I'm actually spending my time, effort, money, worry, everything else on something and I'm not even sure God has called me to that. Maybe maybe being faithful this year means chopping that off and I'm not doing it. Um, And As you do that, then, what that leads us to and what we're going to come to the table with is when I discern where it is that God's calling me to recognize because it's God working through me, I need God's grace. I cannot accomplish it in my own power and strength. And so I want to encourage you as we head into this year that we are called rather than just thinking about and again there's nothing wrong you know you may have started off and said hey i've decided i'm going to read the bible through this year or whatever that's great but i want us to think a little bit broader what are the callings because when we stand there on judgment day and this is not for determining whether i'm i'm in or out so to speak but when god's looking to reward it's not just well how many times did you complete your read through the bible plan in a year the real question is How did you serve in the callings I gave you? Because I could read the Bible through two times in a year, but if I'm failing as a husband towards my wife, God would say, but but what about the calling I gave you to love and care for your wife? Or as a father or a grandfather or whatever else it is. So 
we're going to come to the Lord's table to receive his grace. And I want to remind us a couple of things as we come here. Number one, this table reminds us I'm not justified by how well I fulfill my calling. You may be sitting here and know your calling really well and be doing really, really well at it. That's not how you and I are justified. Okay? We're not justified by our work. We're justified by the work that Christ has done for us. So we're going to approach this table not based on whether, you know, I think I did pretty well in 2022. I give myself a B plus so I can come. Doesn't matter whether I had an A plus or a D minus. I come here to rest from my work and to receive work that was given to me as a gift. But it also reminds us our primary calling is knowing God, walking with God, and then we receive grace from God so it can spill over in all these other areas. So we, as always, are going to trust that this isn't just a ceremony, but the Holy Spirit wants to meet you and me and to empower us. And so maybe as we've been contemplating these last few minutes, you're thinking of something and you're saying, Lord, I really need you to, <laughs> I've not been doing well at this. Then the goal right now is, okay, then Lord, I need you to empower and strengthen me because I want to walk out in this calling. There are areas of blessing you're wanting to extend and I want to see you touch that area. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, if you're here and you're not a member of our congregation, you are welcome to participate with us. As Scott said earlier, you just have to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means you're, you recognize I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by what Jesus Christ has done for me. If you recognize that, you are free to eat with us. If not, we would encourage you to uh, let it pass uh, because this is a meal for believers. So, as we come to the table, hear God's word to us. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to come and receive rest for your soul. For what I received from the Lord, I pass on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, you made us in your image with the capacity to know, love, love, and serve you so that our every deed would be worship to you. But in forsaking you, we have fallen, and we try to find fulfillment in our own labors rather than in walking with you. So we come to this table confessing our sin and embracing your free grace offered to us in Christ. Here, we rest from our works and we receive his work in our behalf. Brothers and sisters, take and eat. Lord Jesus, even our best labors are tainted with sin so we could never come before the Father on our own. But you shed your blood for us cleansing us from sin stain and purifying our work so that they are acceptable before the Father. So we come to this table in joy, confessing the sufficiency of your blood, forsaking our works and trusting in you alone. Here we rest from our works and receive your work in our behalf. Brothers and sisters, take and drink.
Let's stand together and conclude with prayer. And I encourage you to cry out asking God to freshly fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you might uh, walk with him this week and he might serve others through you. Our sovereign and faithful God, at this table we have freshly received your grace, reminding us that in Christ we are forgiven and free. Oh, what joy and freedom in knowing that we do not have to justify ourselves before you. So we pray that you would send us forth now to walk with you and to labor, not for our justification or our self-fulfillment, but to serve others in love. Spirit of God, guide us so that we might discern your callings for us. Empower us so that we might faithfully serve others and in so doing further your work in the earth. Lord, we ask that you would work through us to bless others so that they too might taste and see that you are good. Lord, here on the, the, the doorstep into a new year, we pray that this year would be a season of increased faithfulness and fruitfulness as we walk with you and your blessings overflow to bless our families, our neighbors, and our city. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our King. And God's people say, Amen. Now may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. May he establish the work of our hands for us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are blessed with every blessing of God. Go forth and be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.